how hard did you push it till I black out? Yes. Numerous times, yes. What's happening, Municipals? This is Big C and not Ashton. Ashton is not joining us this week. Um, he's going to take a little hiatus, a little break, um, enjoy his time with Liz. But we have a special guest this week. We've got Ben Richards from a great golf course up in uh, northern Washington called Snohomish Golf Course. It is a true gem out in that area. If you haven't played it, it's a must play. You know, everybody that that tunes into the podcast knows that I'm a big Wildwood guy. That is my local track out here in Portland. If I lived in that area, Snohomish would for sure be my local track that I'd play all the time. And the stories that Ben has in his family designing the course, building the course, and now him being the third generation to run it, the stories are fantastic. So, you know, further ado, we got Ben Richards. How's it going, my man? Good. Thank you for the intro there, Chris. That was really nice of you. Absolutely. I mean, it's all truth. So, you know, I got to drive the little four hours from Portland and make my way up to Snohomish, I would say, about a month and a half ago or so. Yeah. Um, nice. And got to actually play with you and your buddy, which was a fucking great time you know re- really great course you guys have a great staff also that's running the the clubhouse i mean the ch- the things you are doing reminds me of a lot of the changes that i'm seeing at some of the courses out locally for us too so you know it was an absolute blast but before we get into that yeah um let's get a little behind the scenes on yourself so How did you start into golf? I know, I mean, you were born into it since your family, you know, runs and operates this course for the entirety of your life. But when did you start really falling in love with golf? Mm -hmm. Um, And where have that, where has that taken you in your life? Yeah. So I guess, like you said, I was kind of born into it. So my great grandfather was actually a PGA professional in the area. He was at a lot, he was at Broadmoor at a point. He was at Overlake up here, a lot of the original country clubs. And so he was kind of the start of the golfing family. His name was Gordon Richards. And then my grandfather, David Richards, his son, was actually the one who decided to go out, build these golf courses. He also became a pro. And, you know, as time went, my dad slowly learned the ropes from him, became a pro. And hence, I'm the fourth generation, slowly taking the ropes over from my father. So, you know, I was literally born on a house that was on a golf course and had a club in my hand from a year and a half old. And ever, and ever since I've been playing. I mean, that's incredible. It, I mean, that's an experience that not a lot of people, you know, get to grow up with. It, the crazy thing is I've ran into multiple people in the last, <laughs> since I've been doing this pod that actually, you know, grew up on a golf course. Ryan <laughs> at Wildwood also lived in the clubhouse on the course when he was growing oh, up. Same type of situation. So, you know that it's it's interesting that there are some stories out there but it's something that you don't run into that often but it, yeah, it's yeah. really cool so your dad uh managed um and built nine holes out at wayne golf club in bothell yes he did yeah out in bothell washington so was that right after he got out of the university of washington yes Okay. Yeah, so, so basically he came out, so he went to the University of Washington, he worked at Warehouser for a year, and he did that, he did the accounting for a year, and then he was like, I'm not going to spend the rest of my life, but you know, at a desk, and he went back, his father was operating it at the time, and so he, with him, you know, he got some money from his brothers, and they built the back nine, and then they built Snow, and then they decided to build Snohomish. So is that course in your family? So Wayne, Wayne Golf Course had actually closed in, let's see, it had been 2013 or 14 now. And so we actually, we sold that course and ended up, you know, putting some of the money back into Snohomish and whatnot. Just the, the city rules at the time, they were taking 
land by the day on our water rights and our conservation. And basically they were slowly deeming it all wetland and taking all the valley out of the land. And we just couldn't, you know, it was right after the recession, we just couldn't keep it afloat. So we had, we sold and got out of there and kind of cut our losses. Yeah. I mean, that kind of was a tough time for golf in general. The 2006 to 2012 was just brutal. I mean, I, I know growing up in the Bay area, we saw, you know, a good, like, 15 to 20 percent of our golf courses close in that time frame yeah yeah and it's, been, it's been sad you know and i would say up in this area there's within 30 miles of snohomish there's probably 10 courses that have closed and they're all almost all of them are like the par 65 par 68 you know that were like the executive the place where you were where you could go learn how to play golf and those places are disappearing and that's what we need back in golf because of the influx. I mean, you running a golf course, you've seen it over COVID, the influx of new golfers that we're getting the, and we're getting slow pace of play because these new golfers don't have those courses to play at because where are you supposed to learn when they're closing all the executive courses and the par three courses that are unfortunately a little bit more of a struggle because mm-hmm everybody thinks that they need to play a par 71 par 72 yeah exactly and so it you know i'm in the same boat where i grew up on nine hole kind of executive tracks and that's kind of how i learned how to play golf before i was even able to step up and play any course like my dad only would let me play prune ridge sunken garden and blackberry farms which were all Mm -hmm. like really small executive courses until I was like 15 when I first started playing high school golf. Uh And then he would pay to take me out to, you know, the more expensive tracks around the Bay area, but it's how you need to learn to play. And if you don't learn how to hit a ball around, you know, a 380 yard par four and a couple really short par threes, you're going to struggle, especially going out to Snohomish. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can sit on the range all day and chip and putt and you're not going to learn what you do on the course, you know, no. so many people out there are practicing all the time and they can't put it together. There's just something about playing golf consistently and learning how to actually score that you can only learn on the course. Yeah. And learning how to strategize, you know, hold a hole is, is something that you're never going to learn unless you actually go out and play the course And yeah. par three courses. Aren't going to teach you that because you're just playing the same thing over and over again, <laughs> where, you know, you have to learn how to, where to put your golf cart when you park it don't put it on the other side of the green right, and take right. an hour or like, you know, repair your divots and, and all those things that you're, you're not going to get at a full, you know, 72 because, they expect you to know those things when you show up. Right, right. Yeah, to put the bunker or like the rake to bring it with you, you know, just all the little things. Yeah. And, you know, and it's like, I feel bad, you know, like sometimes Saturday afternoons, you know, the rounds will turn into five, five and a half. And sometimes they can even get longer than that, you know, on a really horrible day. And it's it's no one's fault besides, you know, these people that they're like you said, they're parking the carts on the wrong side. They don't know how, what to do. And it's hard to educate, you know, this new group of golfers in everything they need to know on these big courses that's a thing that we've talked in you know past episodes about and what i think is a challenge with golf in general right now is the usga doesn't know how to i don't think they even know how to address this problem because it's it's at such a you know localized level Mm -hmm. where it, it what does the usga do at this point where like you know, the golf courses we've said could hand out little pamphlets or, you know, in Europe, they basically make people take tests to be able Uh to see what your level of skill is. Um, We've also said you might be able to have scorecards that list out what your handicap is and you should play a certain T box depending on your handicap. But like, that's just more money being put on the public courses are already Mm -hmm. strained to just be able to afford another piece of equipment to cut the lawn. Right. Yeah. And, you, you know, know, and beyond that, you know, it's also, you know, the ego. I mean, any, anybody that, you know, if they're just learning, they think they should go to the black tees and I don't even play the black tees, you know, and I play all the time, you know, it's not as fun. <laughs> you know. Yeah. And, you I know, mean, you play college golf and you still don't even play the back yeah, tees very often. It's fun to go score and make birdies, you know, and, and, you know, I see people go out there that have, you know, never played or don't play very much. And 
You're just not going to have fun from the black tees. You can have such a better time playing a little bit forward and making a couple pars in a birdie than just torturing yourself out there. Yep. I mean, that <laughs> you're speaking to a guy that uh, will play red tees, kids tees, any tee I possibly want, especially when it's at a course I play all the time. Because mm-hmm. it, it just gives you a new look at the track. It And oh, you yeah. know what? Like, I played the red tees at Wildwood by myself like a week ago. And I still shot a 79. I I didn't shoot any better than I normally shoot when I go out there because I didn't know how to play it from, from the red tees. So, you know, those kind of things are something that I think people should give a shot and see, see what really happens because it just, it's just fun. Yeah. And, you know, even speaking on that, it's funny. One of the ways, so, you know, playing tournament golf and growing up, getting under par and staying there is something, you know, that's hard to do. It's, it gets in your head. It's just, it's hard to do. It's hard to get under par and stay under par. And I would play the red tees in high school to go out there and learn how to be comfortable being under par. And, you know, and I, and that it's just little things like that. And I tell my students stuff like that. And it's, there's, there's so, so many mind games, you know, with it that you can go out there and, and really, you know, it doesn't matter where you play from, you can really help improve your game. Yeah. I mean, and that's a big thing too, is I go play par three courses all the time just to get the confidence and then also to just dial in my approach as well. Uh-huh. So, you know, there, there's different realms of golf that you can practice and do certain things to make your game better. And if you're playing from the back tees and you hit it 240 every time, all you're doing is diminishing your game and you're not going to have a good time ever. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, you're not going to hold three woods on the greens and it's just not fun. No, not enjoyable. Yeah. But- and, that's, and that's one thing, you know, like you said, like the USGA doesn't really know how to approach it. You know, us as a facility, what we've started to do is expanding our forward tees, making them bigger, making them more friendly, more appealing so that those people will go play there. And, you know, we're trying to get some more marshalling out there. And we're actually in the process right now of putting in a new part of three course at Snohomish that we, you and I had talked about a little bit. You were telling me about that and you kind of showed me some parts in the middle of the, in the middle of the course of kind of how yes. you're going to weave it in there too. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so we actually, we just started our first process of kind of, we have to move our tenth tee a little bit in order to allow a path back there, but our plans are that going in the next year or so and have a place where people can come out, be comfortable, be free not have a marshal on them all day long and they can actually have fun and learn golf the way I guess I did, you know, and the way people did at these executive courses that aren't there anymore. Yeah. And I mean that with your guys' Nike camps that you guys have out there for the kids, it's going to be, you know, something that's so great for the community because Mm -hmm. it's going to allow kids to have a proper place to learn. Just like you were saying, a proper place to learn and expand the way they know golf and that's going to be huge because like you said there is none nothing like that in your area at all yeah and and which is really crazy you know the the golf up here is just it's it's few and far between to be completely honest with you that's the one thing i think portland has a little bit better of than the greater you know seattle area (laughs) is seattle's got some great high-end courses some really great private courses but there's no middle ground no. in in yeah. in the seattle area in if you do want the middle ground you're driving to mm-hmm. to find it you know it's it's really not there where like the public courses like newcastle aren't really acceptable for or accepting to a lot of people because i mean you're paying 120 dollars to play newcastle yeah exactly and yeah it's just it prices everybody out yeah and it's just you know it's it's not great we're portland we might we have pumpkin ridge and mm-hmm. and like um the reserve which are mm-hmm. probably the two more expensive courses everything else kind of hovers right around that 60 dollar range kind of in the right. same range you guys are at yeah and it gives a big variety where we also have the children's course the par three course down here and things like that that are allowing the expansion of golf and so seeing you guys include the par three have your kit your junior nike camps and stuff like that is huge for the game of golf up in the seattle area yeah, yeah, no, we really hope so, and we're having a whole lot of fun doing it. So more than anything, you know, it's it's so fun. You know, I I'm not gonna lie, in 2012 ish, you know, being in the golf industry and with how bad it was, I think we all thought, you know, is this it? You know, is this the end? Like, is golf kind of gonna slowly die from here? And it is just so refreshing, and it's just 
it's so nice to see where the game's at right now and the direction it's going. And I'm, it's just amazing. I mean, we all, <laughs> I know us as public golfers complain about the speed of play, being able to get tee times, things like that. But to be honest, it's a good problem to have because more courses are going to be built. More facilities are going to be able to improve themselves. They're also going to be able to improve their, their groundskeeping and, and their, you know, in the, everything they need to utilize to be able to keep their courses at a premium level. And that's Mm going to allow you guys to be able to compete with those larger, um, you know, larger golf courses out there as well. Right. And one thing I know you've been doing, Ryan's done a great job. Matt's done a great job out in uh, Manzanita and Highlands is social media outreach as well. And that's huge. We got to put it out on your wife. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, my wife Kiana has been absolutely killing the social media game. You know, she she got into it. She's been doing it for I think about a year now, and I mean, she just absolutely completely changed everything. Our clientele has changed. You know, people are happy. She, one of the things she does, and I think this is so important, is the quick responses and responding to everyone. And I think by doing that, it just it creates that community and. Really, what the social media is trying to do is we're trying to create that Snohomish golf course community and make you feel like you're part of the family. You know, and we want you to know, like, you're going to message us. We're going to get right back to you because we do care. I mean, she got back to me so fast. It was crazy. You know, (laughs) with what we do and the rating, you know, the reviews that we like to do on these golf courses, I reach out to a lot, a lot of courses. And I wouldn't say that our response percentage is very high. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, we're still new into the into the space, but we for us to be able to do this and be hosted by great courses like you guys, it really helps us to be able to continue to bring these kind of stories to the people that listen to us. So, you know, I got to give her 100 percent props because she basically treated treated me like family from the beginning and, had you know, invited me out immediately, made sure that I also got to play with you, which was great mm-hmm. because one thing when I go out and play courses, I love either playing with superintendents, general managers, anybody that's been on facility for a long time and being able to play with, you know, the person that was there from the beginning of the golf course, you know, dad built it, everything Mm -hmm. like that was absolutely wonderful. And the course is in great shape right now too. Thank you. Yeah. We actually, we have a new superintendent who started this year. Todd Tipke, shout out Todd Tipke. And he came in this year and he's been doing an absolutely amazing job. And I can't wait to see what the future holds. I mean, your greens are immaculate. They were they were spectacular. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Todd, Todd and his his crew is definitely killing it out there. Shout out to Todd and all the superintendents out there killing it, killing it all these public courses. But the conditions are tough for public tracks and especially, you know, you know, from the 2012 time frame and things like that, where when money does get tight, it makes it very difficult for you guys to be able to give the experience that you want to, because you can only do so much at that time where I think with the influx of, you know, players and people joining your club and things like that it's allowing you guys to put money in the proper places to be able to continue that and keep it going for a long time oh yeah 100 percent. you know and we you know with covid and everything you know it's been a, it's been a horrible time for the nation for the world but for the golf business you know it kind of revitalized and it, it gave us a chance you know to kind of sit back and really we're bringing the whole course of the 21st century and using the assets to bring it up and we're putting all back in speaking of you guys just released your new logo which was oh, yeah. super sick yeah thank you yeah, yeah. exciting and we've been working on that for a little while you know the one we had before it was kind of uh kind of just like a clip art logo, you know, that was pretty basic. And I yeah. actually decided to get a good professional looking one this time. It <laughs> looks fantastic. I can't wait to get a hoodie of it. You know, oh, I'm definitely yeah, going to have to send one your way. I appreciate Well, don't send it because I have to come up and play again. So okay, I'll pick it up in person. <laughs> All right. But, sounds good. So going back to where the course kind of began, uh, what year did your dad build the course? So the course was built in 1967. And so before that, it was a, a dairy farm, and it was owned by Bob Bossy, 
And they went out there and they found the piece of land and, you know, it had already been logged and everything. There was no trees on it. It was about almost 200 acres. And so it was absolutely perfect for a golf course. And they went out there and within one year, they bought the property and turned it into a golf course with very little dirt work, you know, and just basically putting in greens and tees, shaping it a little bit, and then planting thousands and thousands of trees. It So if anybody gets a chance to drive out to Snohomish, um, have fun. I, I will say it is a damn challenge out there. There are more trees on that property than I think I've, I, I've played on any other course. I mean, you will definitely get yourself into trouble if you're not hitting it straight out at Snohomish. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're everywhere out there. And it's just, it's crazy that they were all planted, you know, so they're all about 50 years old. And it's just crazy to think about, you know, when the course, the first 10, 15 years, they had to have some in course out of bounds because people were just trying to cut corners and going over the trees, you know, and it's, you know, as time, time went, it grew and grew and grew. And now I can't even hit over them. You know, I can't no. even hit over them. There's no cut. I mean, you have a couple. I can't remi- remember. It was on the back nine. There was par four dog leg, I think, left around yeah, the corner. So, yeah. So we go 14 is the dog leg right, and then 15 is the dog leg left. Yeah, yes. So yeah. dog leg left. I mean, it's not long, but it's an impossible tee shot if you try to hit a driver on that hole. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, like, unless, unless you're like Bryce in the Shambo can hit it 200 yards in the air. You know, yeah <laughs> it's an impossible shot and yeah. i think i think your buddy pulled a driver on that and he ended up you know pretty deep out in the right hand side of it yeah so. he like went through yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it you know those are things where you have to pick your shot out at snohomish and it will reward you if you're hitting them straight you're you're hitting fairways and stuff but it'll definitely penalize you if you're not hitting those fairways, which is oh, definitely yeah. is what you want. And the great thing is, you know, in what I talk about again, I'm going to always refer back to Wildwood as well, but um, it's a amateur design golf course. And what you get out of that is creativity because there aren't holes built into a like manufactured way or, <laughs> a copy of something that's been seen elsewhere. Right. You know, it, it's very distinctive holes that are for Snohomish and, you know, aren't pulled out from, you know, famous courses across the United States. It was your dad going out there and kind of building what fit in the area and mm-hmm. kind of just designing it to how he wanted to play it. Yeah. And I think and, that's the yeah. coolest part about it. Yeah. And kind of let, you know, nature kind of just did its own thing and, and yeah, really shaped it. And yeah, you know, that's that's pretty cool because people always ask, oh, who designed it? Who designed it? And it's like, oh, it was actually, you know, our, our family did and it wasn't a designer. But because, you know, it kind of has a feel that it was designed. Yeah. You know, no. It's like it's laid, the layout fits very well. It's very walkable. And they did a they did a very good job when they built it. For being up as high as you guys are up into the mountains, there's actually not a lot of elevation change hold a hole. <laughs> So mm-hmm. like you said, it is really walkable. Even though you drive up there and you're like, oh, this is going to be an insanely hilly track. We we took carts that day, but, I mean, it was probably as flat as most courses that I've played. You yeah. know, there, there's some undulations in there and some elevated tee boxes and greens, but it's nothing dramatic. Yeah, and definitely, you know, I'd say most of our play, like all of our like members and all of the guys that play every day, they all walk, you know, they're all walking to get, getting their exercise out there. And, you know, some are seventies and eighties and they have a, they have a fine time walking it, but a lot of people do ride. And we actually just got what 20 new carts this week. So that made everyone very happy. <laughs> I know that's been a challenge for a lot of courses. Oh, yeah. I know our boy Andre down at Coos had an issue where his got pushed back like almost eight months. Yeah. So we, we ordered them in, around October. They're supposed to be here in March, and they came last week. So, wow. So yeah. almost, almost an entire year it took to be able to get them. Yeah, yeah but we, we have them now, so can't complain. And we're moving on. So <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, that's just the struggle with all, you know, hard goods in general across the board. I mean, you guys know ordering clubs or – you know it's custom ordering you know i know your pro does fittings and stuff like Mm -hmm. that out there i think you guys are a strix on 
Yep. Cirque Sound yep. is our man. Yep. So, you know, I know with them, their turnaround time has been fairly good just because I built clubs and fitted oh, okay. in my path. But um, everybody else is, you know, a couple months out. So if you're oh, trying yeah. to get a set of clubs, it's it's taking a couple months for you to be able to get them. So, yeah, which is it's tough, too, because, you know, summer's going to be gone pretty soon. But, you know, maybe everyone will be practicing a lot this winter getting ready for next year. I'm hoping so. Yeah. And so in the winter time, how does that affect your guys' play? Because I know – some you guys being a course that was built in the 60s it probably mm-hmm. wasn't built with you know the most superior drainage out of right. uh, out of courses so have you guys implemented new drainage into the course uh over the years to kind of yeah help yeah, that so, so basically you know we're we're kind of lucky that we're on a hilltop so that naturally makes you know most all of the water drains down to a couple of our lower holes and those you know will get a little bit bogged down but basically just over time, we keep adding drainage year after year. And the biggest thing which we started doing last year was sanding, was sanding all the fairways and all of the wet spots. And so we started a new sanding program and that in one year has already started to make a huge difference. And so, yeah, so really you can play year round here. We have, you know, I'd say in the winter, you know, a busy day is 150 to 200 people on a weekend day instead of 300, you know, like the summer. But we, just people will still go out there. They put on their, you know, their waterproof shoes, take out their umbrellas, whatever it is. You know, people go get the job done. And it's it's awesome to see. That's good. I know that's good to hear because I know out here it's a big issue with a lot of the older courses because mm-hmm. the older courses just don't have the infrastructure built into them right. to be able to withstand the the heavy rains that we get in the Pacific Northwest. So I always like to ask any anybody in the Pacific Northwest how they kind of deal with that or what they've implemented into their course because it's it's a in the winter it can be a bitch out here trying to find a track that dries out well enough to be able to play still yeah exactly and you know it's it's so day by day too you know people come out and play the course and it can be one day they come out and this could be in december winter whatever but if we've had three days of sun the course could be absolutely perfect rains that night the next day every shot you hit is going to plug yeah. You know, it's just day to day and, you know, people review it or like people talk about it. I'm like, well, the day before it was really nice. And it's just, just, it is what it is in the winter. You just don't know what you're going to get. I mean, you can only do so much, especially with, I mean, overnight we can get a full inch of rain yeah. in the Pacific Northwest or overnight we can get, you know, half a foot of snow sometimes too. Right, so right. <laughs> you never know what we're going to get in the winter out here. So, you know, windstorm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oh, I'm sure you guys have dealt with fallen trees and stuff like that out on the track as well. Oh, yeah. Every year we lose quite a few. And I think actually the last few years we've been closed due to snow quite a bit, which we hadn't been in a long time. But the last, what, three years we've been closed for about a month each year due to snow. So. Yeah, last winter I know was real crazy out here. I'm hoping we got a little bit more of a mild winter. Yeah. Um, this time so that we can all play through the winter which is going to be nice so yeah me too <laughs> so what else um at the course i know you've done a lot of changes since you've taken over what mm-hmm. year did you take over as would are you the general manager yes i am yeah so okay. now I, t- I took over actually last may as general manager and so before that i had been working in the company and doing mostly with the maintenance side and learning all that side of it you know all the budgeting on that side just to make sure i had a firm grasp because I, I had grown up and then the pro shop side of it but my dad really wanted to make sure i understood you know the maintenance side everything that goes into it because really that's as, that's as important as anything if not the most important if not the most important yeah. and i think that was a big thing you know i chat with ryan as well is that was one thing his dad wanted wanted him to know as well and was to really understand maintenance. And he actually worked um, for a parks department and actually okay. worked as a, a groundskeeper for a parks department outside of the golf industry oh, okay. and was able to bring that back when he came back to Wildwood and, you know, took over the course pretty much the same time you did. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because it's, it's not, you know, maintenance isn't a super sexy job, you know, or anything. But it is so. It's honestly being out there and changing cups and just being out there in the morning and like it's it's awesome. If you're a golfer, I would recommend any golfers if you ever get a chance work maintenance at least for like a summer because it is beautiful out there and you learn so much and you appreciate what what they do so much more. 
I think that's what I think I've picked up the most on since I've done, you know, done the podcast and really talked to people that work in the golf industry is, Mm -hmm. you know, we go out there and beat the shit out of the golf courses. You know, I've always known to put my divots back, fill my holes, you know, all, all the etiquette we're supposed to do, but I've never understood the reasoning and, and what that does to a course if somebody doesn't do those things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I heard from a superintendent where a divot in the fairway that's not replaced can take up to two months to fully heal back, which is crazy shit. If you're getting 300 rounds on a weekend and half of those people aren't repairing their divots, I mean, that's just a disaster for a public track because you're just Mm -hmm. out there constantly, you know, working backwards you're taking two steps forward and one step back every time you know you you do any maintenance right right yeah because you're having to fix all these little things instead of you know the big issues or things that we really want to be focusing on focusing on to provide everyone with a great round yeah i mean it you know if if we could just get more people to repair their divots and their you know their ball mark ball (laughs) marks are huge so what how long would you say a ball mark takes to repair if somebody does not repair it Oh man. I mean, it can take so long. And the, and the problem is since it's on the green, if it doesn't repair properly, it's, it's going to be, it could be bumpy for a long, long time. Honestly, it could be until the next airification. So yeah, it, let's say somebody doesn't repair their ball mark. Do you, when you guys go out and change cups and stuff, does your guys mm-hmm. kind of do a surveillance of the, of the greens every time? Yeah. Yeah. And so they try to put in a clean area and then we do have some tools, you know, that we can, you can ch- fix them pretty quick you know, that we can do around the hole and stuff. But I mean, on a, after a busy weekend, sometimes there'll be 300 ball marks, you know, on a short par three that aren't fixed and you can't get all of them, you know, and then we have to end up air fine, you know, and an extra time in the summer just to smooth it out. And does sanding and rolling it help with that as well? Yeah. Yeah. And the sanding and the rolling is the biggest thing. And then when I, with the airification, sometimes we'll do the small holes in the summer. So okay. small things, just like a needle time, just to go in, make smooth everything out, put a little top dressing down and just to get them rolling good again. What I've seen at some courses are kind of the knife slits uh-huh. that I've seen a lot too. And it's, it's helped out a lot of public courses, it seems, because you can do it every couple months instead yeah. of every quarter or you know every half a year. Mm-hmm. And that allows you to kind of keep up with that as well with without slowing down pace of play because a lot of the courses that do the heavy punches and you mm-hmm. got the heavy sand, you're basically, you got no greens for almost a month at that point. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I mean, you, get, you know, lose all your play for about a week or two, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's brutal. And yeah. So the big things, you know, like you said, this, we slice the greens is what kind of what those are called. We'll slice them. And then just a thin, like a thin layer of sand, we'll, we'll get them rolling good again. If we, you know, if we have a tournament or something that we just need to get them good for. So, so technology has probably really helped you guys for keeping the tracks up as well, especially in public golf, because, you know, back in the day, you either had to hand rotil, you know, the the fairways or, you know, do those yeah. type of things. What um, what pieces of equipment have you guys implemented and brought in to kind of help you guys recover much faster? Yeah. So, you know, just to recover faster, like mowers in general. So, I mean, most country clubs and high end courses, they're going to hand mow their greens and their tees and all that. And we use a triplex, which covers about five passes in a hand mower. And so that we can get all of our greens mowed every day in about two and a half, three hours, you know, sometimes a little longer. But, you know, that's our biggest thing because it used to be you literally had to walk around, you know, hand mow every green, put it on the trailer, go to the next one, and you couldn't do it every day. And, you know, beyond that, once we, we have a roller and you can roll the greens even faster than you can mow them. So days where we don't have time to, you know, to mow or if the greens just need a little break, we can send someone out to go roll in two hours and it argu- arguably rolls better than when they're freshly mowed. And do you guys do this? Do you guys have a sit mower that, that rolls sideways or do you guys yes. do it by hand? Yeah. So basically it's on a trailer. You go out there and you zip back and forth side by side. And it's actually pretty fun once you get the hang of it. <laughs> it looks, it looks enjoyable. It's not, it's yeah. part of groundskeeping that I don't think I would mind doing every day. It, no, it looks exactly. pretty fun. Yeah, no, it's fun. It's fun. The first like two greens you do, and then it's a workout. 
you know, <laughs> digging it off the trailer and going back and forth. But it's not bad, and it's a, it's peaceful out there. So it's cool to see the technology kind of advance because I oh, remember yeah. when I was a kid, especially at the local, you know, public nines and stuff like that. They could only do so much, and a lot of it, like you said, was done by hand, which took forever. You know, you had a twice as many people on your, you know, maintenance staff as you probably need now, which, you know, technology has helped that out, where you used to have to go out and send five guys out to mow, you know, in one day, where yeah, you could exactly. probably send two or three out now and get the whole course done. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. you know, and, and, that, and that's been awesome. And, you know, and all the new technology, I don't know, you know, if you guys know this, but sometimes when you see on the greens or around the tees or just on the course in general, when you see like the brown streaks of the dead grass, what that is, is the hydraulic fluid coming out of the machine. The hose is broken somewhere, something's happened, and that's going to kill that grass completely. And so the new equipment, actually now they use electronic. So it's electronically lowered instead of hydraulically lowered. So you have no risk of, you know, Cause if you go and you do a pass on a green, you completely ruin that green. You know, we've, if you do a pass in the middle of the green, you have a dead spot for months. I've seen that before and I've never <laughs> understood it. I either thought maybe the watering system had issues and it. It was a hot day and it browned it out, but it never yeah. made sense to me. Cause it's like a streak line right through the middle of the green. Yeah. So. And sometimes it'll be like, it'll look like drips, but yeah, it's when a hose gets loose or pops you know, we've had one on a fairway more where it popped and it blew, you know, there's a five foot circle in the middle of the fairway where grass didn't grow for literally a year. You know, we, it, we had Jeez. to change the soil to get it to grow back, you know, and replace that just because the stuff, you know, the hydraulic fluid is, is bad stuff. <laughs> Do you guys have a um, growing green? I know a lot uh, of courses are doing that. Green? Yeah. Uh, so currently we don't, we have three practice greens. So right now we just, from, from one of our practice greens, we'll just take off there, but we are, we do want to get one going again. And it, it's really helpful, you know, especially if something like that happens where you do lose a patch of the green, you can go out there, cut it out and replace it. See, I didn't even know that existed until I went out and played my friend's track Canyon Lakes out in the Bay area. And we were going between the third hole and the fourth hole. And there's this green that just, is empty. There's no flag in it or anything like that. And I never understood what it was. Uh And then one day his maintenance staff was out there, you know, picking holes out of it. And I was like, Hey, what is he doing? And he was like, Oh, that green's just to grow, just to grow extra grass for us to repair any, you know, issues that we have on any other green that it didn't even phase me in my brain, you know, golfing since I was nine years old and I'm 34 now that, that even existed or that that's how things got repaired. And so, you know, those things doing this podcast and talking to you guys really intrigues me on, you know, certain things that you guys have to do to be able to maintain, you know, the levels that we expect. Yeah. All the little things that no one sees. It's, it's difficult too, because, you know, we, we bitch and moan when conditions aren't, you know, super superior as a player, Mm -hmm. but, when I play with someone like you or, you know, any of the guys that run golf courses that I've had the experiences to play, it really allows me to kind of understand what it takes to get it to that point. Uh And then you appreciate when you go out and pay, you know, a really reasonable rate of 40 or $50, you know, for a round that you're like, Holy shit, this place is in immaculate shape for what you're paying. In, yeah, you get your money's worth. Yeah. So, and that's what I say when I go and play places like Pumpkin Ridge, where it's $120 to play, $140 to play. That place better be spectacular. If I'm coming out to play places like Snohomish and Wildwood and, you know, Rose City, where the conditions equal or are better than what you're paying the rate at, mm-hmm. you know, you go to those other courses, you're expecting them to be absolutely pristine. So, you know, we, we, as a podcast love to rate the courses that we play. And, you know, when we talked about Snohomish, I gave you guys a very good solid four out of five because the pace of play, the rate, the everything was impeccable when I came out and played. And, you know, it's very difficult to get a five when it comes oh, to yeah. any of our ratings. That's, that's so, great to hear. And I love to hear that. So, and, and so, 
when I go and play, you know, certain places and we pay a lot of money and we get, you know, either a condition that's at, you know, a little bit rough around the edges or, you know, they're having issues out there. It kind of bums me out because, you know, I would have rather just paid the money and come out and see you guys. So it's a hard, fine line to walk because the rate that you charge to the conditions that the course equals is very important to the golfer. Yeah. Yeah. Expectations are everything there. You know, it's it's all, no. Yeah, for you guys, I mean, running a public course, I'm sure that is probably one of the hardest parts of running a course is trying to keep those conditions at as top level as you can, but also watch your bottom line and figure mm-hmm. out what rates you guys need to charge that aren't going to be too high where people are going to stop coming out. Right, exactly. Yeah, you, it's a fine line you kind of got to manage there. and Definitely. I know with cart fees how are you guys managing those because i know a lot of courses have crazy raised their cart fees and for a reason as they're trying to get more people to walk because the amount of play that is out on the courses and the amount of people that drive carts in very inappropriate ways Mm -hmm. um, they're trying to basically get a charge people a little bit more money to deter them from that Oh, what okay. do you make it more of a premium? They kind of okay. So, like some of the tracks out here are charging twenty dollars a rider. Oh wow! So okay. forty dollars for you know two people to ride in a cart, where that's basically the cost of somebody's green fees most of the time. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so yeah, we haven't you know we haven't actually gone and done anything to to change that yet. You know, it, I haven't seen too much of a problem. We're we're actually you know in the process right now of redoing our cart paths and repaving a lot of the spots just so that people that do ride have a you know better experience and they have a better cart that's less beat up and and you know like I honestly we haven't seen that yet and occasionally you know on the Saturday afternoons the guys will drive crazy you know or you'll have someone drunk roll a cart but for the most part with ropes and having a marshal go out enough we haven't had too many issues. And you guys do a really good job at that with the ropes and and directing traffic. And I think that's something a a lot of public tracks could do that is very cost efficient. That doesn't that's not going to break the bank, but also direct people when to enter the fairway, when to leave the fairway. And you don't see it in a lot of uh, public tracks like we just played Stone Creek, you know, Mm -hmm. over the over the weekend and out there you know you could tell that the right after the tee boxes it's just getting torn to shreds because people are coming in and out off the cart pass and all different Mm -hmm. areas and it's kind of the same way around the greens where people are just going in any direction they possibly can and where you guys kind of direct people this is where you enter this is where you exit stay on the fairway you know Mm -hmm. entirety and I think that's another rule that's kind of a myth in golf, the 90 degree rule Mm -hmm. where I've found out over time, talking to people that run golf courses that the 90 degree rule actually ruins courses more than just having somebody stay on the fairway throughout the whole round. Yeah. Cause you're at, you're going in and out entering back and forth and it just wears it down, wears it down. And especially, you know, when everyone's going in the same spot, I mean, everyone's seen that, you know, the dirt spot. (laughs) Yep. So, yeah, I think you guys definitely have it dialed on that, on that aspect. Yeah. And I feel, you know, like part of that goes back to, you know, it being like the older from the sixties, it's really greens next to the tees. And it's really, you know, you can go out there without ever playing it and just follow the cart paths and you, you know, where you're going, you know, where to go. And, you know, I think that's something nice that you get with sometimes the older courses and that, you know, sometimes now you go play a course that's in a neighborhood and you get, I, I, you know, you get lost all the time. It, especially the newer courses and the, the courses that we hate, what we call uh, track home courses or development courses where they're built basically so people could have a beautiful view out of their backyard. There's two bad things there. They're spread out. And most of those courses aren't walkable for the people that do like to walk. Like my co-host Ashton, he 95% of the time will walk. And the only reason he doesn't is because he's forced to ride on those kind of tracks. And then the second is the, the designs of those courses aren't great. 
just because they're building them according to what they're they're given land wise because of the housing developments. So in in those are actually the courses that I think you're seeing kind of drop off, mm-hmm. you know, over the last 10 years and a lot of the ones that have closed because people are realizing that that's not what they want when it comes to golf. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. and you're seeing the resurgence of, you know, of the like natural landscape tracks and stuff like Tom Doak and Gil Hance and those guys are doing as well. And people want to seek out, you know, adventurous courses like you guys have kind of nestled up in that, you know, forest of a yeah. course you guys have. And like what we kind of like to say, it's close, but away from it all. So, you know, it's not, it's 20, 30 minutes from the city, but you can get out there. And it really feels like you're out in the middle of nowhere, and it's it's nice. It's and pretty. when you drive up to Snohomish, it's got to be one of the coolest like drive ups too, because you come up onto this crest of a hill and you see your guys' big barn with the Snohomish, you know, golf course logo on the side, and it's a really really great entrance uh, to a golf course. And you know, if, if anybody goes out there and plays, which I hope you know our listeners in the Pacific Northwest and anybody visiting the area goes out and plays Snohomish, I hope you go out there and experience it because it, I mean, it'll beat the shit out of you. You guys stretch out to what? 6,800 yards. Yeah. It's almost 6,900. Yeah. So, I mean, you can play up to, I think your up tees were 57. Yeah. So I think right now we're at, we just added a new one. I think 5,500 is the shortest. Okay. And that gives you the range of, you know, all different types of play which to be honest most older courses are at 55 to 6 so Mm -hmm. you guys being as old of a course as you guys are to be able to stretch out as far as you guys do is great for play and adding those extra tee boxes made it dramatically you know uh acceptable for the new golfers and people like we were just talking about that are trying to find the executive style tracks to be able to experience exactly that. Yeah, I would, I would guess when it opened, it would have had to be probably one of the longer courses in the in the area. You know, just because back then they didn't make them that long. No, I mean sixty seven is is what they played Pebble Beach, the pro am out there for until about ten years ago, and then they finally renovated and extended that out past seven. So yeah, yeah. you know that was probably one of the longer tracks on the PGA Tour when I was growing up. So <laughs> you know that that for something built in the sixties is a stretch and if you guys go out there it is i would never play from the tips at your guys's track can can you imagine it with like wooden clubs and a lot of balls from the no (laughs) no way like modern technology from 67 at your course would be a disaster yeah yeah yet alone busting it you know 250 down the middle with a wood club (laughs) yeah impossible yeah so i mean you guys got a great track out there and then Another track that your family runs is um, is Battle Creek. Yes, yeah. We're involved in Battle Creek as well. So where is Battle Creek from you guys? So it's just a little bit north of Snohomish. It's actually right off I-5 in Marysville. And it's built actually on the Indian reservation, the Tulalip tribe. And it was an old paper farm that my grandfather and, a, um, and his brother and one other partner purchased back in... I think it was 88 and then they built the course there and it opened in 1989 and it's a similar, you know, cut. the difference was it was a paper farm. And so all the trees were already there. And so instead they just carved it out through the trees. So as a paper farm, they, they basically just would uh, cut the trees down and then yeah, they, they every- had it all self self contained there. Yeah, so pretty much, I guess, however many years it would take, you know, I'm not sure to grow. The trees grow, cut them all down and replant and do it again. That's pretty sick. So was it in the similar shape as what Snohomish was, where most of the trees at that point were kind of mowed down for the paper mill? So, no, it was actually the trees were all probably around 20 to 30 feet tall, maybe 15 to 20. So they were all they were decently established. And it's, it's a little bit of a different piece of property. There's a lot more wetlands. It's a little more, you know, it's even more woodsy, I'd say, than Snohomish. You can lose some more balls out there. 
But yeah, it, it, they're both pretty similar. You know, when you get out there, it's the big tall trees, the defined fairways. And, and so who uh, runs that guy for you guys? Yeah, so now it's um, he actually is a part owner up there. It's Fred Jacobson, who was actually the manager at Snohomish for 40 plus years until I took over last year. Awesome. So, so you still, so, same guy, just took yep. over the other track. Yep. So yeah, so he's been, you know, part of the Snohomish and Valkyrie family forever. And, you know, it's it's really fun. We all seem to get along pretty well and kind of make it work. So, <laughs> so how far are you guys out from Seattle proper? Yeah, so from like the city of Seattle with with no traffic, it's about 45 minutes. Okay, so definitely doable for anybody that lives in Seattle proper to come out and play. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, you just hop on north on I-5 and then it's just right up the road there. So it's not too yeah. bad at all. So if anybody's used to driving south and playing, you know, home course or chambers, it's about the same distance as if you guys are, you're just driving north instead of driving south. Yep, yeah, you're driving up into the woods and the mountains a little bit. And you know what? The price point and the play that you're going to get out at Snohomish, it, it'll be a day where you're going to want to put 36 in because it'll be about the same price as going out and trying to play home course or, or chambers. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> It's always fun to get 36 in too. Yeah, so please, guys, go out there. Check out Snohomish. It's a, it's, I can't tell you how good it is. I mean, it's going to be your Pacific, your basic Pacific Northwest track. Lots of trees, hard turtleback greens. You know, it it's it's a wonderful course. And again, Ben, his family, and everybody that runs the course is absolutely spectacular. So you you can't go wrong going out to Snohomish and playing it. Awesome. Well, Ben. Thank you, Chris. Hey, I appreciate you coming on. I'm going to get up there hopefully in the next month or so. My brother lives up in Seattle, so, you know, I'll grab him and and we'll head up your way and and get around in soon with you. Perfect. I love to hear it. Looking forward to seeing you. All right, buddy. Take it easy. Yeah, you too. Thanks, Chris. Bye.